Right, so I'm just going to start. So we've talked a lot today about some of the more abstract challenges that we're facing. And I know in some of the groups, we we're more interested in discussing what the, the main themes were. But I wanted to have a quick look at three of the main areas that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis to concretize this and look at some real examples. So yeah, from going from abstract to concrete. The first quick example I want to look at is email. The second is commercial websites. And the third is social and instant messaging. So we're going to look at good tech, bad tech. So bad examples and then more humanized examples. So let's kick off with email. So what do you think your email wants you to do? Check it. It wants you to check it. It wants you to check email. It wants you to send email. It wants you to receive email. It wants you to become the, the basically the cattle of email, to just keep generating it and going on and on and on. And one of the ways it does this, of course, is through notifications. So this is the little game that we play every day when we look at the front screen of our phones and we get a little cue, either that's a visual cue or a haptic cue, an external trigger that incentivizes us to act. And the reason that this is a bad idea in terms of the kind of impact that it has on us is that it creates what's called a dopamine loop, or several dopamine loops. So whenever you get a reward, and it's small, you get a hit of dopamine in the brain, which is a reward chemical that makes you feel good. Now, there are a couple of things here that are quite disastrous about this. The first is that we tend to seek more than we are satisfied. So when we're going to seek out rewards, our desire for that reward, our hunger for it, is usually much stronger than the satisfaction we get when we finally get the reward itself. So it's a sense of being in perpetual motion towards that goal. This is exacerbated when the rewards that you get are very unpredictable, both in terms of time and in terms of size. So you don't know when you're going to get that hit on that infinite scroll of tweets from someone that you really fancy or someone that read your article that really loved it. You don't know when you're going to get the reward or how big it's going to be. So you end up in this addictive behavior, habitual behavior of use, of constant checking. So it encourages uh, your use of said tool, but it also, as we heard earlier, with a 23 minutes sort of focus time, you get interrupted, takes 23 minutes to then regain that focus. It also causes lower productivity and performance, and in the meantime, anxiety. So let's look at a humanized example of something possibly similar to email. I don't know if any, has anyone here heard of Slack? You must have heard, okay, quite a few of us. So Slack um, came out, I think it was last year, and it started taking Silicon Valley by storm. It's a completely different type of process-driven approach to communication that's similar enough to email to make it easy to use. So low cognitive load, feels familiar, but it, it makes a real point of making sure that you are in charge of all your notifications. It puts you in the driving seat and in control. So you, you're able to say what desktop notifications you want, uh, whether you want any kind of mobile push notifications, etc. And what's really interesting is that it allows you to selectively choose which channels you want to be involved in. So instead of having this massive stream of emails coming into your inbox, you get to see which ones are relevant to you and then dip into the at everyone conversations that might be useful for your entire organization. Another one which I love and I use constantly is Mailbox. Does anyone use Mailbox? Yeah, OK. This one's brilliant. Again, it's really process driven. And it uses the swipe right, swipe left. It's really intuitive. The whole point of Mailbox is to get you to zero. It wants to get you to zero. It's not like Google, which is just keep all your information in here, archive everything so that we've got everything on record. Um, this one's a lot more uh, geared towards getting you to store things, whether that's through uh, reading it, putting it in a list, or getting it to come back later if it's less urgent. And that means that if you're swiping through this stuff, you're able to process it, which means that you're freeing up a lot of the limited cognitive space that we have, conscious space, to deal with problems at any given time. So it frees up our ability. Quick look at commercial websites. Um, we've mentioned a little bit about dark patterns. And I want to remind you just briefly what these are here. So they're user interfaces in products or on websites designed to trick you into taking certain actions. Now. The Times website is not the kind of website or brand that you would expect to find dark patterns on. I tend to trust them. I trust their news reporting. Um, I think they're fairly kosher. Well, I don't know about how kosher they are. Anyway, they're pretty good. They're pretty standard, pretty robust. And so when I was looking to get access to um, a review of a particular book that's come out by Richard Thaler, a behavioral economist, I found that when I was trying to read it, it says it wanted me to subscribe. Well, all right, well, let's see what it says. So you scroll onto a different page all the way down, and it says, OK, 30 days, free trial, one pound. Of course, being someone who uses web psychology, there must be a catch. What's the catch? So you click on it, and you say, OK, view full details. View full details. And here it says, what's included in the pack? Is there a special offer? 
what contract am I buying? Okay, so then it says one pounds for the first 30 days, then six pounds per week thereafter. At no point in that really important bit of the contract does it say how to annul your contract, how to cancel. That's really important. Right. No, it doesn't say anywhere. It doesn't say anywhere on there. So you think, oh, shit, well, where am I going to find it? So I had to hunt for it. You hunt at the top of the page, which I've left in, hunt, cancel. Under miscellaneous, it's put cancel. How do I cancel my digital subscription? That's not miscellaneous. If you're taking my money, that's important stuff. It's not miscellaneous to me. So you click on it, and it says, to cancel your digital subscription, you must call us on 0800, blah, blah, blah. Cancellations are subject to clause 27.4 in the terms and conditions. Right, so they're making me hunt again. So you go through, eventually you see part three cancellation terms. You go down, and this is what really pisses me off. They say, you must call us, call us at least 15 days before the billing of your next date, otherwise you'll be required to make your next bill statement, which is 26 quid a month. So basically, they've made one of the key things, as in you know, being able to cancel your subscription, a key point of agency to be able to leave the relationship. They've made it really, really hard for you to do. And this is not acceptable. Let's have a look at humanized examples. So websites that are using web psychology or that are using behavioral sciences to facilitate instead of coerce. Um, Amazon, it's a mixed bag Amazon, but this is the best example of this specific thing, so I shall use them here. What's nice is they, they facilitate you to make the choices that you want to make. They don't ram it down your throat. And then when you go to the account section, this is fairly recently they've added this, um, you get to buy stuff again that they've seen you buy several times in the past. So they're making it really easy for you to make the choice. One click orders, um, yeah, so lowering cognitive load, making it really fluent and easy. Another example, which is a favorite one of mine, I hate shopping, I love buying clothes, but online shopping is a complete uh, nightmare because you have to trawl through all these sites. Shop style is brilliant. They actually give you a little tip. They say personalize your own results by selecting your favorite brands, and they make it really simple for you to filter things through. But again, it's elective. You're choosing the stuff. It's not them choosing it on your behalf. So let's look at the third and final example, which is around social and instant messaging. We've heard spoken about Facebook Messenger, which I'm sure many of you have discussed, and the fact that they can tap into your audio and then serve you ads based on what they've been earwigging with you about. Samsung TV also did this, but they actually have videos on and the rest of it, and they could snoop into your room, and people didn't like it, so they canceled, uh, and there was a massive furore. With Facebook Messenger, we kind of expect them to do this evil stuff, so we seem to make less of a fuss. But the problem is that all of these different apps, because they have high utility and it's convenient, they don't bother to get any explicit permission because they know that the utility and convenience is high enough for us to think, oh, it's too much bother for me to confirm my worst fear that you are spying on me every second of the day. Also, it's not clearly defined what you're signing up for with the psychometric information last year that came out uh, and the, the test that they did with showing some people happier news feed items and some people sadder items and seeing how that affected your mood. That was covered in a really broad brush in their terms and conditions about we may under, undertake research with our customers. That means nothing. I mean, they can do whatever they want. And what's also absolutely awful is that the UK law, being sluggish as any government is really, doesn't currently protect us from being monitored in this way. So we have some serious challenges that we're facing. So what about some more humanized examples? OK, this is a good example. Open Whisper Systems have created this app uh, called Signal, which is a private encrypted messenger service that allows you to make encrypted text uh, communications with people who have it, as well as calls. There's also support for this um, in iPhone settings, which you can just find fairly easily. And what's useful about this is that the end-to-end -end encryption cancels out the issue that you would have with Facebook Messenger. So use this as an alternative. It's also heavily secure. And what's the genius bit about this is that pretty much most apps that you find that use this sort of thing, that use encryption, like PQ chat or whatever, require so many different steps to get you to that point that it's too much effort. So you're not going to do it. But what's lovely about Signal is that the usability is as simple as the native apps within the iPhone. So it's really easy to switch over. Another example of a humanized uh, instant messaging or social service is Twitter. Now, this is an interesting one. You'll see there that um, it says location disabled as the default when you're trying to send a tweet. If you then go to change aspects about your account, you have to, to log in a second time to make sure that it's you that's actually doing the logging in. So they obviously take privacy and security quite seriously. When you do log in and you see your dashboard, it's the second thing up there. It's really salient in terms of the information that you're going to get to see. And they've actually created a system where you have to add in a location to your tweets 
which means that when you're talking about people who are potentially vulnerable, so people who are getting stalked, people who are maybe getting bullied, people who are activists or people who are journalists reporting from places that they don't want to be tracked, this is really helpful because it protects you by default. So even if you're putting something out there and you haven't been careful to strip out the metadata, you're still protected. On the other hand, these things are never quite that simple. And there is an issue, which is that if you're sharing stuff, like if you're a photographer and you're sharing your photography, of course, including out all the stripping out of the metadata, it will also remove your name and copyright information. So there are other issues at play here. OK, another quick two examples. Um, we've had Tristan Harris mentioned already. He does some work at Google and is moving into a different area, similar to this, called time well spent. And he gave some really interesting examples at the Habit Summit in Stanford when I was also, also speaking about simple conscious hacks to get you to become aware of your habitual behavior. So this one, when you check your iPhone, didn't you check 10 minutes ago You're like, or 10 seconds ago? Gets you in your tracks. Uh, and this one, for instance, if you're using Google Messenger, I know a lot of people in this room use this to communicate within their teams. Well, if you're constantly being interrupted, you're not going to get any work done. The productivity of your company will suffer. So what about a focus setting where you can just say, right, for the next hour, I'm focused. You can send me a message. It will go into a holding pattern, and it will remain pending unless you increase the alert level to seriously urgent, in which case it will come through. So there are really simple opportunities for businesses to actually create humanized examples that empower us. So where does this leave us? Well, as individuals, I think we have to be much more conscious of what we're signing up to as far as we can and how technology is shaping our behavior. As a society, I think that we need to find ways in which the law can actively protect our individual rights, uh, especially within this new paradigm of communication and economics, because everything is changing at a dramatically fast rate. And as businesses, we need to lead the change, because people pay for these services. They want solutions. We have to design them for them. And so alternatives that are not just profitable, which they will be because it's the first mover advantage, but also long-term stuff that empowers people, builds trust, and creates a better world for us. So the vision of the world that you want to create. Quick word on best practice, though. We've got to think about ways to sort the good from the bad. And as at the moment, and one of the sort of reasons for putting this conference on, is because we don't have any sort of standardized, accepted uh, ways in which to judge cases. We can kind of say, well, that doesn't make me feel good. This does this and the other. But they're all quite abstract and nebulous. When we're looking at creating a new standard, maybe best should mean long-term and holistic and not just quick and easy. And I think that it also shouldn't be about the tactical wins, but about the long-term business benefits in society as a whole, so a more strategic approach. I have a few rules of thumb in the absence of standardized practice. The first is, does this thing that I'm working on, this service, this product, this platform, does it facilitate, not coerce? Is it mutually beneficial? Is it helping my customers as well as helping me? And if you were the user, how would you feel about being on the receiving end of this technology? And that's crucial. Remember, people, not users. So really, it's up to us to set a, standard, a set of standards that work. So we need to be thinking in the long term, thinking about how these sorts of technologies can connect us and also empower and enable us to live the fullest lives possible. And we need to become aware of how tech is affecting us in the first place. So I'm very excited to announce um, that I have created, in tandem with a behavioral researcher who lectures at Goldsmith, a web health survey. It's currently uh, been submitted to cyber psychology and various other peer-reviewed journals for publication. We will see what they say. But we've conducted it as a study. It's now up and available for you to try out so that you can assess yourself across six factors of web health. So I don't know if you want to take a screenshot. If you want to, you can try it now. You'll be the first people out in the public that have tried this, aside from the participants that we all ran, ran the study with. Um, and the six areas that you can test yourself on, utility, how it's impacting your social life, how absorbed you are in your technology, where it's make, whether it's making you narcissistic, how it's influencing your sleep patterns, and various other negative outcomes that might be there. And it's a great tool to help us to do those things. So thank you very, very much for coming on this warm day. Um, it's been an extraordinary experience for me. And it remains to say thank you to everyone who's helped. Also, the last few things. There is a pub dinner at 8.15. There's a few spots left. I'm going with a bunch of other people around the corner. If you want to go, speak to, uh, well, let's say, let's speak to Emily, who's in the striker top over there, or M, who's at the back. The slides and videos will all be available. I'm making a password-protected part of the site, so you can download everything. That will be in the next couple of weeks. Um, and if you are interested in attending any meetups, I'm thinking of doing one quarterly meetup a year, which will be number-restricted so that we can do more intimate work. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for coming.